Good afternoon, dear Zero Project uh, friends. Welcome or welcome back. I'm Luc Selderlo, and the coming 15 minutes, I have the pleasure and the honor discussing uh, business and employment issues with uh, David Faisiel, who has developed a very interesting uh, company, and it's more than a company, it's also a concept, Helix Opportunity. But before diving into the story of your company, uh, David, introduce yourself. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my second Zero Project conference, and I'm very impressed and loved all the work the ESSO Foundation is doing here. So um, I'm a survivor of a traumatic brain injury. August 2nd, 1996, I had a hemorrhagic stroke that left me completely paralyzed in the entire left half of my body, okay. blind in the left half of each eye, and of course with severe cognitive issues. I wasn't supposed to survive, but I did. So I had to learn to walk, talk, basically live life all over again right before you know, starting high school. Um, you know, worked for the Air Force for a while um, after I graduated high school, graduated college, and decided that I wanted to start a company that focused on um, including people with disabilities in the workplace and the consumer marketplace. But, you know, okay. my background with the Air Force was in union representation, so it was a lot of fighting. And I didn't want to be about advocacy and fighting. I wanted to be about bringing people together under a common cause. And that's what. The so, no fighting, but solutions. You know, not just solutions, appreciative inquiry. You know, okay. What works best, and how can we leverage unique strengths to bring people together to achieve bold, provocative purposes? Not just to accomplish Say that again. something, a bold, provocative purpose. We define and design with a provocative purpose. And that's Great. how we create meaningful experiences Great. that go beyond accessibility, yep. but that provide you know, quality of life and you yep. know, fun and that kind of thing. Uh, we're going we're gonna to discuss that in, in, in a second. But maybe something about your, your company, Helix Opportunity. Would you describe it as a successful enterprise? Yeah, you know, it's not an overnight success. Nothing is. It, you know, it took nope. me about yep. 10 years working with the government to get my funding secured to start okay. this company. Luckily, in the United States, you know, any person with a disability has vocational rehabilitation available to them. Yep. And that includes you know, startup costs for funding yep. a business. And mm -hmm. I did just that. And, um, you know, it, but it takes a while to prove that your, your concept is actually viable and that you can accomplish what you say you're going to. And now Coming you're there. Yeah, yeah, coming to conferences like this and G3ICTs and enabling and stuff like this, you build those relationships and you find those partners and those networks and, you know, that can lead to success. And I'm very lucky to have been able to have that support. Okay, okay. Looking at, at what is out there, you, you see more so-called inclusive companies. What, what makes your company different from the many others that are out there. Yeah, so again, it goes back to this whole accessible versus inclusive design type of situation. You know, we have accessibility everywhere, but that tends to create an unintentional stigmatization of people. It puts a spotlight on how we're different. And, you know, we were talking before, you know, this chat started, yep. and um, when I was young and my brain hemorrhaged, when I finally got out of rehabilitation, they sent me home with a walking cane, you know, and yep. being a, you, any human being, we just want to belong. We want to be a part of a group. We want to be a part of a tribe. We want to be included in something we want to feel meaning in life and not be you know set Belonging apart is different to something is indeed essential to right, feel happy right. to, to to live as a human being huh? right but no one's going to ask me to borrow my cane like it's a shirt you know that's a band that we all like or something like this no one's going to ask to borrow a hearing aid because they want to use it you know it, it sets you apart in an awkward kind of sort of sense we need these things to actually interact in life but because of this awkwardness a lot of the times people with disabilities we just cast our assistive technology, our accessibility features aside, to try and get by as part of a group and to live life without feeling that extra sort of discomfort yep. and, and uh -huh. that kind of thing. And so we wanted to move past that. We wanted to focus on defining and designing meaningful experiences, you know, that incorporate all the features you need to touch the human senses and faculties so we can all experience the same things together. And you have, see here right now this learning management system that we have developed that kind of sort of, you know, goes along those lines. So the yeah, show us, show us a bit of Yeah, so the meaningful what you're doing, experience yeah. here is an immersive education experience. For those of you that went to college, you can kind of sort of recognize it's divided into schools and buildings and things of that nature. So where does the accessibility come in? Well, I'll show you. So you turn on the volume, and each one of these features... Welcome to the Business Development School of Global Inclusion. Please click here to register. Even the form fields. Please enter your email address in this form. Please enter your password. So, 
So I know we don't have a whole lot of time to go through all of the mm-hmm. features on this, but here's the, here's the kicker. We didn't do this to be accessible. I didn't say people that are blind are going to use this device or, the, or this application. I want to reinvent the screen reader. What I wanted to do was create an immersive experience that was fun and engaging. Why? Because when you're having fun doing an activity, your brain secretes neurotransmitters, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins. These reinforce learning. But there's also a phenomenon called suspended disbelief, where we will suspend our notion of reality just to enjoy something that we're doing. Like you're watching a movie, and a girl breaks up with a man, or vice versa, and you're like, oh, you idiot, why did you break up with them? They were so wonderful. You know it was a script. You know you know it's not reality, but you're suspending your notion of yes, reality indeed. to enjoy that movie. Yes, and indeed. that's how you get that meaningful experience, and it's translatable, and you, know, you can choose whether or not you want to use these features or not. But... It gives you agency and power because it's a choice and not a necessity. It's a preference, not a requirement. And that's what makes it inclusive. Let's try to turn that into to an advice to policymakers. Uh, so many organizations work on diversity. So many policies are, are designed to, to, to facilitate accessibility. What is your message to these policy makers? Oh, I'm to those so actors? happy you brought this up. So, um, you know, I, so, our, so on that side, on the employment side, we focus on, and this is all developed around the concept of appreciative inquiry. Finding things that we can all, you know, common goals and concepts and bold provocative purposes that we can all get behind and yep. achieve together, right? So when it comes to policy and workplaces, we're so hell-bent on problem solving Well, disability is a problem to be solved in a problem-solving world. We all learn from very early on root cause analysis. You find the problem and you eliminate it. Well, that's dangerous. It can manifest itself in all different kinds of ways. Passive aggression, um, you know, physical aggression, verbal aggression, exclusion. You're right. So, you know, and that's still the the policymaker's vision today is problem-solving. So whenever I go to talk to a company about here's the market opportunity of disability, I have to sort through disease and poverty reports to find the economic impact. That takes a long time. What company do you know is going to say, I've got an idea for a new market. Let me go to disease and poverty reports to find out how I can reach them or how much money they have. Yeah. None. And very few people have thought to actually look at, you know, look through these things to find that opportunity and that nugget of here's a concept to sell you for or sell, or sell to you, you know. And so to the policymakers, I would say think more appreciative. Think more about economic impact and holistically how can we all band together to create something bold and, and, and you know, to, to provide an economic impact for this, this user group or this, this demographic, really. That, that's then your advice to policymakers. What, what would you recommend to the many NGOs, international NGOs, international actors that work on diversity, that invest so much time and energy in, in designing more uh, accessible uh, devices and products, uh, what would be your recommendation to them? If you want it to be mass marketable, and it has to be, it has to be inclusive and not just accessible. It can't be just for people with disabilities. You know? And we were talking earlier again, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I mentioned Dragon Speech. So Dragon Speech was an early text-to-speech application that was for people with disabilities. You, know, you could speak your text, and it would write it out for you and things like that. Well, there's a big misnomer in the world that a lot of people think accessibility leads to innovation. Not true. I'm sorry, but accessible devices... Can, can you repeat that? That's an important message. It's not true, and I apologize. It's, you know, for whatever reason, it's unfortunate, but accessibility is not sexy. It's not, like I said, it's not something that someone's going to borrow and say, let me use your screen reader, please. You know, it, people don't do that. Why? Yeah. For a couple of reasons. For one, we don't, nobody wants to identify as being disabled. Even those of us with disabilities, the hidden ones, which is 75% of the world, we, we try to get by as much as we can without having to bring it up. You know, my, I'll give you an example that I spoke about earlier. My, my best friend in the entire world who yes. you know, uh-huh. unfortunately took his life in 2014 because of mental health issues. And I apologize, this is something that I, <laughs> for some reason, always have to talk about. But, you know, he wore hearing aids growing up because he had profound hearing loss. And when he was younger, he would grow his hair out really long to hide those hearing aids. And as he got older and felt more comfortable with his body and, you know, realized that he was an attractive person and this and that, he cut his hair shorter. But he would only wear one hearing aid. Hopefully no one would see it. No one's going to borrow a hearing aid and say, I want to use this. But what happened? Apple made it sexy. They embedded hearing aid technology into AirPods. 
everybody wants to use an iconic AirPod. Well, you see it, it everywhere, huh? Or, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, and that's inclusive that, you know, so you can create accessible devices, applications, and whatever, but find ways to embed it in mainstream activities and technologies so it's no longer just for the disability population. What I, what I saw on, on, on your website, and now try, try to link it, um, I saw the concept of unlocking the power of human inclusion. Is that what you mean by what you just told us? Yeah, you know, so our, th our thing is this. We believe that all human beings are unique, right? We all have these, you know, differing sets of strengths and weaknesses, but there's something that we all share in common, and that's that human condition, the human experience, birth, death, love, life, struggle, you know, we, we all want to be loved, right, uh -huh. you know? Uh, of course. So these are the ways to connect, you know, the human beings, and you can do this through any kind of design, any kind of device, any kind of environment, by focusing on first defining that provocative purpose, that meaningful experience, and then designing a pathway to engage as many of the human faculties as you can, you know, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. And uh -huh. yeah, it's possible. You can actually give vision to people through their tongue. This is a new innovation. Yep, indeed, that is, yeah, indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just have to be creative and you have to think about it and you have to go from the experience standpoint first instead of the functionality standpoint. Let me just make this work. Okay. You know, and another example of this is, uh, you know, we've done a lot of user research work for one of those big uh, restaurant, fast food restaurants that you may or may not have had on your show, uh, you know, a day or two ago. <laughs> oh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not at liberty to talk too much about it, but, you know, we would bring in uh, individuals with vision loss and that were blind to do user research projects and... As a user researcher, you don't really want to tell someone how to do something. You want to give them a task to do and observe how they do it and find out what can we, you know, how can we make this easier for them or kind of sort of expand more on their preference. And the very first thing these individuals that had, were blind or had vision loss would do is they would say, hey, Siri, and start to do the activity that way instead of turning to their screen reader, instead of turning to their talk back on their Google devices okay. or their voiceover on their, you know, Apple devices. That says a lot. Okay. You're very convincing. You convinced me. I don't know. I, talk I would fast. like to know more about your, your, your products, your way of working. How, how do I get in? I, I just register? Um, so, so the learning management system is how we teach courses right now. We're going to okay. offer it as a software, as a service product uh, on subscription uh, soon, hopefully. Uh, but, you know, anybody can come to H E L I. XOPP.com. That's Helix Op with two P's.com. Okay. Check us out. You know, you know, send me an email to the contact form and we can, you know, talk about disability inclusion in the workplace and the consumer marketplace. One of my most exciting projects that we're doing right now is we are the first and the only registered apprenticeship program for digital accessibility in the United States. The United States wow. Department of Labor has um, authorized us to provide uh, digital accessibility developer training and apprenticeship programs all throughout the U.S., and we're focusing on the disability population because this is the one career field that it's advantageous to have a disability in. Okay. So we're scaling up the disability population in mass in digital accessibility career fields and staffing them at different companies and, and supporting them. And that brings in a completely new reality, and uh, of it, course. Of it course. does, and you know, eventually we want to expand this to developing countries at no uh -huh. cost and just allow them to attend the training while we're okay. training other people. You know, this for uh, starting our first cohort, is this March? No, uh, next month. Uh, so, and we'll see how it goes. But after we get a couple under our belt, we'll you know, soon start great. bringing in other economies. And it, it, it is great for us to to have people uh, like you here at the Zero Project Conference. Uh, what would you like people to take home from this conference? The relationships, you know, I, I've built so many wonderful relationships over the years and it's just, it's really important because it's not networking, it's, it's you know, it's collaborations, it's partnerships, it's a long-term sort of impact. And, um, you know, I do a lot of user research projects uh -huh. around the world and my one goal for this time around was to find the partners in Japan and in Germany and okay. the United Kingdom that I will need to, you know, to be successful at these projects and especially this one that we're doing right now. And, and I've made those connections and not being here, I wouldn't have been able to do that and you know it's one thing to learn about policies and how to do stuff but once you have these people in your life on a day-to-day -day basis whether it's through linkedin or and email, it starts huh yeah it, it yeah. manifests itself you yeah know? absolutely absolutely um, is there something you take home yourself 
I take home the love of my community, you know, oh, yeah. and, and, okay. and these wonderful people that I've met. Like I said, my my partners, you know, and um, and this is going to be long term things. You know, this wouldn't have been possible had it not been the other conferences that I've gone to and made relationships with, yep. and learned from these people in apprenticeship programs and in design and those kinds of things. So. Yeah, that, I think that that is it. It's you know, it's furthering these okay. relationships, and it's what I look forward to you, every year. You're doing great work, and we have 60 seconds left. Give us a hint. What what is next? What will you do next? Oh God, global takeover with this apprenticeship program. I want to global scale, takeover. I want to scale up the that's ambition. <laughs> I want to scale up the accessibility profession in mass, especially in developing countries. They need it, but. They need the employment opportunities as well. And yeah. I hope it's like the Field of Dreams movie. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we're building it. Great. Now the companies need to come. Dear audience, dear Zero Pro Project uh, friends, this was uh, David Fazio. And please feel free to visit his website, uh, Elix uh, Opportunities. David, it was a pleasure. Oh, pleasure is all mine. Thank forgive you me much. for the fast talking. Thank you.